Well, welcome everybody to the Centre for the Study of Islam's afternoon lecture today. Um, we're very fortunate to have with us um, uh, uh, Professor Sean Roberts from uh, George Washington University in the US, who uh, has very kindly made time to join us this afternoon. Um, uh, he is the um, director of the International Development Studies Programme and um, uh, and uh, is a is a um, associate professor of the practice of international affairs at GWU, which is a uh, uh, a fantastic job title, and I'm sure uh, fully reflects Sean's <laughs> skills, because we're very fortunate to have him join us. He's done a whole load of work, particularly focusing on the Uyghur people and Islam in China more generally. Um, he spent a lot of time doing ethnographic work. Um, and uh, he worked, it, worked for the States Agency for International Development for some years um, in Central Asia. And so he has a wide experience of the region and knows the uh, political context as well as the international context and the local context very well. And so he really is the, exactly the sort of person to, to ask to come and talk with us and join us for some of the discussions that we're having in the department recently about the situation uh, concerning Muslims in China, which has been something which has been on a lot of people's minds. Um, and so it's uh, really good to have you with us, Sean. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, uh, of course, I should say that um, uh, Sean will, uh, if you want to read more of Sean's work, then he's just published a really fantastic book called The War on the Uyghurs, China's Campaign Against Xinjiang Muslims. And um, it's published by Princeton University Press. And um, uh, I've been looking through it over the, pe the, the recent week. Uh, it's a really um, uh, a fantastic piece of academic work, uh, as well as uh, giving you information with which you can uh, analyze the situation and understand um, what's going on. Um, and I think it's unique in the field for that reason. And we're very fortunate to have you with us, Sean. Very grateful for the time that you've made available for us this afternoon. Um, uh, Sean, we, as I mentioned before, we're, the aim is to, for you to give a presentation um, of about 40, 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. And my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Sajjad Rizvi, who is the, um, who is the uh, director of the Center for the Study of Islam, will um, we'll, we'll, uh, marshal the questions for you. So, Sean, um, are, you are you ready to kick off? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, gracious uh, introduction. Um, I will be using a PowerPoint, so we'll um, start that. I think it'll take a second. There we go. Um, yes, so um, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm, I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, it's actually... Uh, the uh, cover of my book on the right is actually uh, the UK version, which is with uh, Un University of Manchester Press. Um, and I'll be talking uh, about a lot of the things that are in my book um, and trying to kind of uh, paint them in broader strokes. But uh, uh, if you would, if you're interested in, in diving more deeply into it, um, I certainly encourage you to take a look at the book. Um, I'm going to start by just talking about what, what is happening in the Uyghur region of China now. And a lot of you probably have um, some, some understanding of this. Of course, it's very much in the media, um, but I'm going to uh, kind of provide my perspective on what's happening. Um, you know, first of all, uh, one of the things that's the most headline grabbing is the creation of these mass internment camps. Um, but it's important to know that in addition to the internment camps, there's been a, a significant uptick in just regular arrests. And in fact, um, you know, I, I have suspicions that the internment camps are, are becoming less and less uh, important to what's happening. Uh, and a lot of the people who are still, uh, the, the government still wants to um, have interns somewhere or being sent directly to prisons and giving actual uh, 
prison sentences. Um, but you know, we first heard about this in about 2017. A lot of researchers were looking at uh, satellite imagery. They were looking at government procurement documents, and it was documented that they were building. Uh, the Chinese government was building about a hundred different. Uh, prison-like structures throughout the Uyghur region. And then people uh, started disappearing into these um, centers. First, the state suggested that they didn't exist. And then, and then they um, said that they did exist, but they were essentially um, vocational training schools, but also uh, specifically for, for uh, people who were suspected of being prone to Islamic extremism and terrorism. Um, in these in these institutions, people are subjected to uh, forced Chinese language training and also uh, ideological training. But there's also a lot of uh, other things happening. Um, significant, I would say, psychological torture. Um, people are under complete surveillance. Um, it's very much a prison-like situation. There's reports of uh, torture, sexual violence, and so on. Um, the other thing you've probably heard a lot about is the mass surveillance, in particular the high tech side of it. Uh, I think the BBC just released something uh, yesterday, maybe, on um, the uh, use of artificial intelligence in terms of trying to measure uh, people's moods and uh, emotional state uh, that that they were the Chinese government was using to subject uh, people in the internment camps to. Um, but also, there's been a lot of reporting on uh, the significant surveillance on in, in public spaces. And I think what's important about it, uh, beyond the artificial intelligence, you know, facial recognition and so on, what's most important is uh, a massive database that the state started constructing. Um, I think they, they procured uh, the actual uh, software for this in 2014. Um, but it's been sig significantly put to use by at least uh, 2016. And it, it's able to essentially keep electronic files on every uh, resident of this region, um, particularly uh, Uyghurs and other uh, Muslim indigenous groups in the region. Um, and, and that includes both uh, surveillance, electronic surveillance. It includes stuff like people's internet history, uh, reports from uh, workplaces, uh, and it also includes um, a lot of other human surveillance um, uh, that's done through party members who've been sent out to rural areas to uh, spend time living with families to, to essentially take notes on uh, the degree to which they reflect extremism. Um, but I, th I think it's important to see these two very headline grabbing aspects of what's happening as kind of a cornerstone of a complex of destructive policies. Essentially, um, the, the combination of the mass surveillance and the threat of being put into an internment camp or prison makes um, people a, a very um, pliable in terms of what they will um, acquiesce to in terms of state policy. So that's, that's kind of the coer coercive nature of what's happening. You know, in the internment camps, <laughs> it's been suggested that upwards of a million people have been sent to those. And we also have data that um, there, there's been a, a massive increase between 2017 and 18. I think there were 300 um, convictions in the re 300,000 convictions in the region, which was um, something like a 10 time increase uh, over um, the past. Um, and uh, most of those people um, who ended up in prison were uh, prominent Uyghur um, figures. So essentially, the people initially in prison were um, party members, were artists, academics, and so on. Um, so in, in that context, um, you're, you're always aware that you may end up being imprisoned or interned. Um, and in the meantime, the state has uh, kind of rolled out a whole other series 
of policies, which I think hint more at what the purpose of, of uh, these policies are. Um, it basically means that any resistance in any form can be detected and result in imprisonment or internment. And, and I think that's allowing the state to remake the region and its people uh, with, um, without any resistance and yet create an illusion of volunteerism. Um, so some of the things the state is, are, is doing uh, aside from the surveillance and, um, and uh, imprisonment and internment include a lot of forced or coerced assimilation measures. Um, this includes uh, active suppression of Uyghur cultural expressions and language for out, those outside the penal institutions, and then coercive mix, mixed ethnic marriages, um, increased uh, mandatory Chinese language, uh, instruction, including in boarding schools for children, and a lot of children are being sent to these boarding schools because their parents are uh, either interned or imprisoned or in residential labor programs, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, and also uh, coerced participation in Han holiday celebrations um, and uh, the suppression of Uyghur holidays. So there's, there's, there's kind of a general uh, tendency, which, which I think is, is reflective of uh, broader policies in China towards ethnic minorities right now. There's a real attempt to um, push assimilation, but in the context of the Uyghur region, that becomes much more coercive and um, to a certain extent violent. Um, another thing that uh, the state is doing is it's removing signs of Uyghur cultural legacy. Um, you know, uh, the Uyghurs uh, have a very, I would say a very eclectic um, and diverse uh, expression of Islam, um, but uh, underlying a lot of it is, um, are Sufi traditions that go back quite some time. So uh, saints' tombs are, are extremely important to their culture. And uh, you can see here, this is a prominent um, pilgrimage site, uh, a tomb of a saint in 2011. And in 2019, it's been essentially decimated. Um, also, there's been a lot of reports about the uh, destruction or repurposing of mosques for tourism. Mosques are being turned into restaurants, into hotels, and so on. Um, there's also uh, other ways they're transforming the terrain through the destruction of civilian cemeteries. Um, and, you know, that's partially a, a larger state um, push to get rid of cemeteries and push for cremation. But um, it certainly uh, is devastating for a lot of Uyghur families in terms of uh, just without any kind of consent having uh, the cemeteries where their family members uh, are buried removed. Uh, there's a removing of traditional architecture, demolishing of entire Uyghur villages. Um, and then uh, the course residential labor programs, uh, I think are probably in many ways, the most important part of the state's um, campaign in the region. Uh, it's taking some of the people who've gone through the internment camps, the kind of process of re-education into Chinese language and state, state ideology, and also a lot of efforts in the internment camps to kind of obliterate any attachment to religion. Um, and uh, so a lot of those people are being funneled into these programs, but also a lot of rural Uyghurs uh, who are not, um, who have not been through internment camps are also being funneled into these programs. Uh, and they're framed as poverty alleviation programs, but they're essentially, you know, it, like everything right now in the region, uh, if you refuse to participate in one of these programs, it essentially results in charges of extremism. Um, and that can in, in turn result in internment or imprisonment. Uh, that's very much the same way the, the kind of coerced uh, ethnic mixed marriages are working is that, you know, that, that if you refuse a hand in marriage, that is considered a reflection of extremism. In fact, it's even one of the stipulations of extremism in the regional 
de-extremification code. Um, but this labor program is, is a massive program and uh, it's both um, working with residential factories inside the Uyghur region and those outside. In fact, I think that's one of the most controversial aspects of it. There's an attempt to spread a lot of the uh, a lot of the workers outside of the Uyghur region, which in many ways results in kind of ethnic cleansing of the territory, you know, displacement of these people uh, to inner China. But it also means that uh, this this very uh, coerced labor scheme is essentially um, intertwined with most of Chinese production throughout the whole country. And then and therefore it invades a lot of uh, supply chains in the West as well. Um, and also the people who are in these programs basically uh, have limited movement. Um, they, they live in segregated dormitories. Um, they're subjected to the same type of stuff as in the camps with um, mandatory language classes and classes on uh, the party's ideology. Um, they're forced to work in a, a Chinese language milieu. Um, and essentially it, it, it serves uh, both as a, a mechanism of displacement and a mechanism of assimilation. Um, and in the meantime, uh, those people working in these factories, their children uh, are very often being sent to uh, boarding schools where um, Uyghur culture and language is essentially absent. Um, and then finally, most recently, there's been uh, increased evidence of attempts to reduce Uyghur population density. Um, and this is uh, essentially through trying, uh, trying to subject Uyghur women to um, for forced IUD placement, sterilization, and abortion. And um, there's lots of evidence from state documents that the, the whole purpose of, of these um, programs are to reduce the Uyghur population density. Um, it's kind of uh, on a theory that if you uh, can essentially settle this region with a more significant Han Chinese population that, um, that will liquidate the solidarity identity of the Uyghurs and, and create more assimilation. Um, there is, uh, there's actually state statistics that show the results of this. Uh, so in the Uyghur majority areas of Kashgar and Hotan, for example, there was a dramatic 60% drop in birth rates from 2015 to 2018. Um, and uh, also, you know, having too many children has been a reason for internment or imprisonment. And also um, there's uh, some, some uh, testimonies by women who were in internment camps suggesting that they have been sterilized inside the camps. Um, and uh, I think that it, this is, it, it's an interesting um, issue from the point of view that it's at a time when the Chinese government is actually lifting all of the uh, birth control regimens that have been in place uh, for, you know, the last two decades. And, um, and at the same time, they're, they're reinstituting them and uh, with more fervor in the Uyghur region, um, which I think belies some of the intent uh, of what's happening. So I, I call all of this, uh, all of these policies, uh, essentially a concerted effort at cultural genocide. And I use that term, um, because it's it's a term I'm I'm familiar with in anthropology, um, referring to uh, essentially the the liquidation of indigenous peoples, um, you know, and and most uh, most often through the process of settler colonialism, you know. So the examples of Native Americans, uh, natives in Australasia, and so on. Um, but it seems very much that. Um, all of these efforts are an attempt to do this. It's not an attempt to uh, essentially uh, liquidate the population, but it's, it's, it's effort to thin out the population uh, to um, completely break any sense of solidarity, um, to destroy the culture and uh, eventually kind of marginalize on the side 
of um, the development that's happening in this region. And I think the key issue here is that it's really more about the region than it is about the people. Um, you know, I think the state's intent is to essentially uh, settle this region, develop it into a more generic part of China. Um, and uh, over the last several decades, there's been resistance to that effort among Uyghurs, and that has resulted in this very, um, very kind of extreme attempt to uh, control the, the Uyghur people and other related Muslims in the region and to essentially sideline them, completely pacify them. Uh, and I think, you know, part of this drive is about the Belt and Road Initiative, um, but I think it's also just a greater uh, demand to ensure the development across China and, and uh, consolidate the control over this specific region. So just to give you an idea of the region, if you're not as familiar, um, you know, it sits in a very geostrategic uh, position, particularly in terms of China's economic ambitions, because it's, it's a natural hub for the, the Belt and Road Initiative. It, it's, it's the area that extends to the West and the Southwest across Eurasia. Um, and it's also an area uh, that's had been kind of a tenuous position um, in, in within modern China's history because it is so much uh, on the outskirts, on the frontier of Chinese power, and its borders actually intersect with other countries more than it does with the rest of China. And um, it's important to know that a lot of the efforts we're seeing in the last four years have been focused on the south of this region because that was the area that uh, had had the least amount of state penetration and had the largest Uyghur population. The north area uh, for, for decades has been developed and has a significant Han Chinese population, but there had not been the same penetration in the South. Um, I, one of the things I wanna talk about today and, and a lot of what I deal with in my book is how um, the war on terror has been used to facilitate this settler colonization. Um, and I think settler colonialism, you know, uh, or any colonialism uh, always has uh, some sort of moralistic justification. Uh, and, it, and, and at the same time, genocide really requires a dehumanization. Um, and we see uh, kind of both of those happening through the war on terror. Um, you know, although colonialism always has material motivations, uh, you know, we, we're very familiar, all of us, with the civilizing project of European colonialism as uh, being uh, uh, a reflection that this is a benevolent endeavor um, and not an attempt to just usurp land and exploit natural resources and displace indigenous peoples. And um, I think it, what we see happening now is very much um, in, in, the China, in the Uyghur region of China is a, a replacement with, of the civilizing mission with this idea of de-extremification or de-radicalization. And you know, the savages who need to be civilized are essentially the extremists and terrorists. Um, and, and very much the approach of the state mirrors this kind of, um, this kind of logic uh, there's a famous uh, quote from uh, a, a Native American boarding school in the U.S. where the director said that the, the, the goal of the school was to kill the Indian in the student and save the man. And very much um, the Chinese approach here is an idea to kill the Uyghur in, uh, in, in the people and to, in order to save the people, right? Um, but uh, I think that the war on terror has been very much uh, a, a vehicle that has allowed that kind of logic to take place. And in fact, you know, a lot of people have talked about how the logic of what the Chinese state is doing in the Uyghur region shares a lot of similarities with uh, European and American approaches to issues of extremism. Um, and I know, although I don't know much about the program, 
the PREVENT program <coughs> in the UK is often discussed as being kind of a, a, a less violent but mirror image of what the Chinese state uh, is claiming to do. So um, how did this happen that um, what might have been the, the savages of 19th century and early 20th century colonialism turned into the terrorist of the 21st century colonialism? Um, you know, in, in uh, China, um, after 9-11 after in 2001, um, I think globally, first of all, the, the, the label of terrorist took on new meaning. Um, you know, in the U.S. in particular, uh, terrorists were essentially painted in a, in a light that dehumanized them, made them uh, essentially um, enemies of modernity, enemies of progress, uh, and this, this justified um, the suspension of their human rights. Um, and, you know, you see this throughout the, the U.S.-led war on terror, um, you know, non, as terrorists were non-state actors, it was assumed uh, that military actions against them didn't nearly, didn't have to adhere to internationally accepted rules of combat between states. Um, you know, Guantanamo Bay is the classic example in the U.S. of, um, of essentially not, not uh, taking people into an internment center, not labeling them as either criminals or, um, or prisoners of war, but just leaving them completely unclassified and, and, and their status completely unclear. Um, and I think what's been most corrosive about this is um, there's no internationally accepted definition of what a terrorist is or what terrorism is. And that has allowed states to manipulate this in various ways. Um, and I do think with time we've seen over the last 20 years, this discourse on terrorism also um, uh, essentially foster this global Islamophobia where um, Islam becomes associated with an ex in a, a, a sense extremism and uh, as the vehicle for terrorism. And, you know, we see this particularly in non-Muslim majority states. Um, now, in the People's Republic of China, um, they didn't uh, really discover terrorism or they, and they didn't label Uyghurs as terrorists until 9-11. Um, but, but they, the, the state was very much obsessed with the issue of Uyghur separatism in the 1990s. Uh, and this was very much because of the fall of the Soviet Union and um, China's reading of that situation uh, that suggested that uh, it, was, it was the ethnic autonomy given to people in the Soviet Union that led to uh, the state's demise, the Chinese government became very focused on, on uh, territorial integrity in the 1990s, particularly in Tibet and the Uyghur region of China. At the same time, Uyghurs, uh, you know, if you, if you go back to that map, they uh, were right on the border and, and really Uyghurs um, culturally share much more with Central Asians than they do with Han Chinese, um, they began looking at the establishment of independent states in the former Soviet Union in Central Asia and thinking, well, why don't we have our own state in China? So there was certainly, I think, an uptick in desire from Uyghurs for more self-determination at the same time that the Chinese state was becoming more and more paranoid about the issue of territorial integrity. And so this, this led to uh, uh, a lot of very uh, repressive policies throughout the 1990s in the region uh, framed as anti-separatism campaigns. Um, you know, and they would target essentially intellectuals uh, that uh, were assumed to be nationalists. Um, they would also, they were also targeting Islam to a certain extent because the state uh, perceived of Islam as facilitating a certain amount of Uyghur nationalism and resistance to assimilation. 
Um, so this created a standoff between the state and Uyghurs um, throughout the 1990s. And, th and this did lead to some isolated instances of violence in the region, which were usually played down by the state at the time. Um, but there was no sign that there was any um, organized uh, kind of Uyghur resistance at this time. There were more um, kind of isolated instances of violence, some which were not political violence at all, that some of them were uh, just protests that were put down by, um, by security organs and then uh, turned into violent riots. Um, but it, almost immediately after 9-11, the Chinese state started to look at this situation and decide uh, that really its worries about separatism were worries about terrorism. Uh, and they also, the, the Chinese state also saw an opportunity to link uh, its concerns with Uyghur separatists to this new global uh, campaign against terrorists. Um, and so they, they initially put out several uh, policy papers uh, suggesting that uh, the Chinese state faced a serious terrorist threat from Uyghurs and that it was directly linked to Osama bin Laden. And uh, these papers offered a litany of organizations in Europe, Central Asia, Turkey, as being part of this terrorist conspiracy. Um, and, uh, you know, most, I think the international community, for the most part, uh, kind of ignored these claims because, for one thing, a lot of uh, countries knew about these organizations and, and knew that they were, you know, largely human rights groups. Um, maybe nationalist groups, um, but most of them really did not have any kind of um, any kind of Islamic face, um, and uh, they were much more Western facing. And uh, to perceive that these groups were linked with Al Qaeda in Afghanistan seemed to be very far fetched. Um, the state also basically said that. 200 violent instances that took place in the Uyghur region in the 1990s were the work of this terrorist network. Um, so they were saying this was a problem we've had for a long time and uh, we've been seeing um, now that it's all linked to Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. Um, so while the, the international community initially kind of ignored these claims in 2002, uh, the U.S. government recognized one group listed in this document uh, called the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement, or ETIM, as a terrorist organization linked with Al-Qaeda. Um, and it gets put on the U.S. terrorist ex exclusion list, and uh, the U.S. also helps China get it on, um, it recognized at the U.N. On, on what's called the U.N consolidated list of groups that are linked with Al-Qaeda and now ISIS uh, and, and the Taliban. Um, and when the U.S. does this, it actually takes the logic from the Chinese government documents, which were claiming that there was these 200 terrorist instances, uh, terrorist uh, events in, in the Uyghur region during the 1990s, uh, that were linked to a variety of groups that were in this large network, the US government says all of these 200 events, most of which uh, would be very difficult to characterize as terrorism, uh, were the work of this one group ETIM. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the uh, original research in my most recently published book was an attempt to try to understand <coughs> what this group was um, that, that became recognized as a terrorist group and then has been the justification for what's happening uh, to Uyghur people in China now. And um, the original group, ETIM, which never called itself that, it called itself the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Party, um, was essentially a vision of this guy, Hassan Masum, um, and it existed um, to the extent that it really existed as an organization at all from 1998 to 2003. Um, and it was basically uh, a small under-resourced group 
um, that was religiously inspired, um, but actually not really connected with Salafism. In fact, it was very much um, at odds with Al Qaeda and the Taliban. And, and there's quite a bit of evidence that the Taliban essentially held this group in check at China's behest. Uh, Hassan Masoom had gone to Afghanistan with the idea that he would create uh, a base for an army to wage a war of independence in the Uyghur region. Um, and, you know, there were you know, maybe a few dozen Uyghurs who came through Afghanistan at differing times between 1998 and 2001, who um, ended up around this orbit. But a lot of them, I don't think, were really, um, really saw it as an organization at all. They saw it as, you know, an opportunity to learn how to shoot a Kalashnikov. And there's no evidence this group ever carried out any violence anywhere. Um, let alone the 200 acts of violence that um, the Chinese government says it, 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 it committed in the Uyghur region during the 1990s. And the organization ends with uh, the death of its leader at the hands of the Pakistani military in 2003. So essentially, as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of ETIM. Um, and it was really nothing um, of concern, of security concern to the Chinese or um, really to anybody. Um, but it, it, it served as an important um, facilitation for an increase in repression uh, on Uyghurs inside China. Now, something else happens a little bit later. In 2008, another group emerges called the, calling itself the Turkestan Islamic Party. Uh, and it's led by this guy, Abdul Haq, in Waziristan. And this group uh, does have alliance with uh, Al-Qaeda. And um, it basically becomes famous because it threatens the 2008 Beijing Olympics with several videos on the internet. Um, from my research, all I can find is that there, it was likely a handful of Uyghurs who were in Waziristan probably fighting in multinational uh, groups um, of foreign fighters at the time. Um, but because they had made these videos around the Beijing Olympics, they got support for the making of more and more videos. So it becomes a very prolific video producer um, that essentially continues to uh, egg on the Chinese government's anti-terrorism campaigns. And then uh, it reemerges in 2013 in Syria in a, what, in a completely different guise and potentially with um, some support from uh, the Turkish government. Um, and, and this group uh, actually is the first Uyghur group that you see as a fighting force. Um, and, you know, I could see where the Chinese government could see this group as a security risk. Um, but it has yet to pose any risk um, to, we, to, to the Chinese state at all. And probably most importantly, none of these groups had any presence inside the Uyghur region. Um, but um, they essentially, that the narrative that, this, that these groups existed um, allowed the Chinese government to uh, through to, from 2002 to the present to be uh, running campaigns to search for terrorists within this region. And um, interestingly enough, between 2002 and 2009, there's almost no violence in the Uyghur region, which kind of belies the true threat of these groups. Um, but we do see at the same time significant development happening. And we do see, uh, you know, a continuation of these anti-separatism campaigns, but now a little bit more aggressive and framed as counterterrorism, uh, which kind of uh, also alleviates the problem of international criticism uh, during this time, where the world was kind of united around counterterrorism. Um, but the mass development and uh, the kind of anti-separatism campaigns, which also were uh, largely anti-Islam, um, led to 
significant ethnic riots in 2009 uh, in the capital city of this region, Urumqi. Uh, and I really see this as a major turning point in uh, the relationship between the Chinese state and Uyghurs. Um, this, it's, what happened was it started as a protest um, by university students calling for justice because several Uyghur workers had been killed at a factory in Southern China. Um, when the security organs crack down on these protests, it spirals into street violence and it degrades into ethnic violence for three days, including both Uyghur on Han and Han on Uyghur violence. Um, and, you know, it was, it was, I think, a very troubling incident for the Chinese state. This is probably the, the most uh, significant ethnic violence that had occurred uh, in probably the history of communist China. Um, but it had nothing to do with terrorism. It was spontaneous, passionate, uh, and I see it as an explosion of tension over development and migration, because you had both Han uh, migrants coming into the region to take advantage of development. You have development transforming the Uyghur region um, and uh, also uh, the demographic shift that is happening creates tension that facilitates this violence. But uh, the state essentially blames Uyghurs exclusively. And interestingly enough, they blame religious Uyghurs from the South. Um, and this leads to um, much more intense counterterrorism campaigns, uh, specifically in the south of the Uyghur region. And we start to see um, a cycle kind of start of escalating repression, met with violent resistance, met with repression, and that just keeps on kind of escalating in the region. So really between 2010 and 2014, there are a lot of violent instances in, um, particularly in the south of the Uyghur region. Um, and, you know, e even so, when I look at these, uh, you know, analyzing the different violent events, um, very few of them uh, look to qualify as what I would call terrorism. Uh, and in fact, most of it are clashes between uh, Uyghur civilians and security organs of different types, uh, police and so on. Um, and as this violence gets worse, we also see um, a couple terrorist um, attacks basically, um, but there's no evidence that these are linked to external groups whatsoever. They seem to be um, you know, homegrown attacks. There's one in Kunming, there's um, one in Beijing, uh, there's one in Urumqi in, in, the, in the Uyghur region. Um, and that really starts to um, change the relationship between the state and Uyghurs significantly. And it, and it really increases the Islamophobia in China in general as, as the state tries to link this to a serious uh, terrorist conspiracy. Uh, in 2014, the state starts this People's War on Terror, uh, which is the prelude to the present. And that includes um, significant restrictions on uh, religious activity. You know, it, it's when there's an attempt to, to stop all veilings, to make sure men don't have long beards. Um, there's a lot of surveillance, particularly in rural um, in rural Uyghur communities in the south of the region. Um, and so that those are the people who really feel the pressure at this time. Um, and then uh, in, in 2017, um, that's when we see the beginning of this um, kind of complex of policies that are, are, are basically fostering what I would consider cultural genocide. Um, and it seems that the, the goal is essentially uh, to pacify the Uyghurs as a people and to break their, their connection to the land as well as any uh, solidarity that the group has. Um, and um, just in conclusion, um, you know, I, as I hope my, my talk is kind of illustrated, 
I believe the actual motivations of what the PRC is doing to Uyghurs and other indigenous peoples in, in the Uyghur region is about development and settlement of the Uyghur homeland. And particularly these southern reaches, which as I mentioned early on, earlier on in my talk, had not really been penetrated by the state uh, previously. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, the global war on terror really accelerates um, the state's tactics and makes them more violent um, and, and um, begins to frame this essential, essentially colonization of this region as a counterterrorism problem. Um, and what we see since the beginning of GWAT is, is essentially the, this kind of staged um, perspective of the state where it first begins targeting Uyghur na nationalists uh, um, as an, uh, an obstacle to development, you know, during the 1990s, calling them separatists. And then it begins reframing this um, as a terrorism or extremism problem after 2001. Um, but at a certain point, it begins targeting Islam itself as the root of extremism and ends up essentially racially profiling the Uyghur and related people's entire collective identity um, and assuming that that is the extremism that um, creates an obstacle to the state's plans in this region. Um, so, you know, just as a postscript, I think it's important to understand um, state motivations and ideologies um, as being uh, mutually reinforcing, but uh, sometimes being different. And, and we, I think we see that in this context where if the real motivations are about development and settlement of this territory and essentially the pacification of the Uyghurs. Um, I think that a lot of the people involved in implementing these policies see it really as uh, an effort at counterterrorism. And, and they begin kind of um, uh, internalizing that concept, you know? And I think this is the same way we would have seen um, European colonists internalizing the civilizing mission um, of European colonialism, assuming that this was actually doing something benevolent for the people. Um, and so we really see this kind of meshing of the idea, I think, of 19th century savages that um, helped to facilitate European colonialism um, in, in China today being replaced with a narrative about um, Islam, extremism, and terrorism. Um, and it, it is important, uh, since I know some people here uh, are interested in Islam in China more broadly, it's important to note that this, this is the, the ec extreme nature of these policies are apparent primarily in this region and less so um, among other Muslim groups within China. So, um, uh, you know, this is why um, I basically view what is happening um, as cultural genocide in the name of counterterrorism. Um, so that that's uh, my brief overview, and we can open it up to questions. Already gone. <laughs> okay, well, just just in case Wolf has already gone. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Sean, for that uh, <clears throat> very um, very full kind of presentation, which I'm sure has raised lots of issues. Um, uh, someone's already got their hand up. But uh, just before we do go to the first question, uh, I just wanted to say that if you have a question, you can put it in the chat if you wish, or you can put your hand up, and uh, we can come to you. So. Um, uh, Samira has a hand up, so um, uh, please go ahead. Hello, I may have missed this, but um, what what terrorist or claims of terrorist acts had the Uyghurs done prior to all of the starting? Uh, 
Like what exactly was it? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, there's different stages of this. So they're in the 1990s. Um, the violence uh, that occurred in the region. There were two instances that I would classify as terrors, and there are two bus bombings. Um, one in 1990 and one in 1997. Um, and um, the other violence was mostly um, violence between civilians and police. Um, some of it was essentially protests that were cracked down by the police and then turned into violent riots. Um, some of it was, uh, you know, an attack on policemen. Um, and one of the problems is we don't have extensive information on any of these violent instances. But there's certainly multiple, for most of them, there's multiple possible um, interpretations of what was happening. Some of it, um, you know, could have been personal grudges. Some of it may have been criminal activity. Um, some of it might have been politically motivated. But at the same time, um, during the 1990s, I was doing a lot of field research in Kazakhstan. And I knew of no Uyghur organizations. I knew most of the Uyghur nationalist organizations, um, and I was essentially studying them. I, I didn't know any that were capable of carrying out um, actual violent, violent acts. Um, later, so the second phase of violence, um, one is this incident in Urumqi in 2009 that the state uh, essentially classifies as, as terrorism. Uh, and, you know, it, it's very difficult to make any case for that being a terrorist event at all. It's, it's you know, um, essentially a, a massive civil dis uh, disturbance that uh, is sparked by protest. Um, and then there's um, a bunch of violence between 2009 and 2013 in the south of the Uyghur region, mostly in rural areas, uh, that again um, is mostly attacks on police. Um, and often it's, it's difficult to know whether, you know, wh who began the violence, whether it was essentially, um, you know, police violence met with re violent resistance or whether it was you know, retribution for previous police violence. Um, but my review of all, all these violent instances, uh, you know, suggests that really um, much of it looks very much like you would see in a, a variety of places um, where you have tension between police and racially profiled minorities. So, you know, it shares a lot of similarities from, you know, what you might see in, in the US in terms of the, the very um, tense relationship between police and African Americans. Um, and then there are essentially, I would say four um, violent acts that I would classify as terrorism that happened. First in 2013, there's a family of Uyghurs who drive an SUV into Tiananmen Square and um, hit a bunch of civilians. Um, and then uh, shortly after that, there is um, a first a, a, um, a group of Uyghurs attacking civilians in a train station in Kunming uh, in the Yunnan uh, region of China. And um, with knives. Um, and then there's a bombing at the Arunshi train station. Um, and all of these seem to be politically motivated, um, but they don't, they don't seem to have any connections to any of these, these jihadist groups outside of, of China. So I don't know. It, and I, I go to I go into painstaking detail uh, into the different instances in, in the book as well. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions, comments? Uh... Can I ask questions, Sajat? 
Um, Ali, please, yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Sorry if I missed because of the, I didn't know how to uh, connect it. My question is this one. I would like to know Robert's prediction when the Afghanistan, when the America take the force out of Afghanistan, how the, again, ISIS, Taliban, this of thing would be increased and would affect, the, would affect or not? I mean, do you think would be spread like a coronavirus everywhere? Because they would be whole country. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, I think the the threat to China about um, the situation in Afghanistan is not um, necessarily Uyghurs, but it is that um, I, you know I think that the fact that there's been this one Uyghur group in Syria that's one of the last. Um, groups fighting the Assad government in Idlib to this day, um, they've gained a lot of uh, sympathy from other jihadist groups. Mm -hmm. And it is at the same time, you know, it, it, a lot of people are usually asking me, why aren't, you know, Muslim majority states speaking out about the situation uh, facing Uyghurs? Um, and, you know, there's, there's a variety of reasons for that, but you know, that's exactly one of the motivating factors for these jihadist groups is their distaste for um, the elites, uh, particularly in, in uh, the Arab world. Um, and so, you know, I could see I could see jihadist groups starting to take up this issue, at, you know, against China. Um, uh, however, my my other, you know, kind of impression uh, to the extent that you know I've gone into looking at um, jihadist groups globally I think a lot depends on their benefactors and what their benefactors agenda is you know for this Uyghur group in Syria I imagine you know they're they're really nothing more than mercenaries and um, you know they can't go back to China um, they probably can't stay in Idlib um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see benefactors, you know, um, use them as proxies elsewhere, you know, whether that be Turkey or somebody else. Okay, thank you. Um, if, before I come to Istvan, um, we have a question about genocide. So um, has it been the case that uh, there are very few people have been openly uh, willing to describe what's happening in the West as genocide um, with the Uyghurs. Um, uh, because of course, once you label something as genocide that has all sorts of legal and other kinds of implications, um, uh, you've already sort of described this as a cultural genocide. So um, mm -hmm. do, do these terms matter? Uh, how do they matter? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what I've found is um, they matter a lot less than we might think they do. They don't matter that much in the legal um, arena because for one thing, you know, states can't be found guilty of genocidal crimes. Um, the genocide convention suggests that uh, if, a, if a signatory to that convention um, believes a genocide is occurring, that state is obliged to do something to try to stop it, but it doesn't describe what that something is. Um, now it does of course have, I think a lot of ramifications um, in the popular imagination and, but it also makes it very contested in the popular imagination. You know, um, the, the description, the legal description of genocide in the UN convention is much broader and basically includes a lot of the things um, that uh, I describe as cultural genocide. Um, but the popular uh, perspective is, you know, when we when we hear genocide, we think of the Holocaust and we think of mass uh, murder, you know, the extermination of genes, um, and uh, so that becomes a very contested issue. Uh, you know, a lot of European states, um, well, not a lot, but, you know, a, a bunch of states have um, put out uh, proclamations that they uh, 
believe what's happening to the Uyghurs qualifies as uh, genocide. I think most recently, uh, Lithuania, um, and also um, uh, the Netherlands parliament put out a proclamation. The US State Department has um, but in, in the grand scheme of things, you know, I, I always tell this to my students about international law is it's very uh, discouraging when you find out that um, international law uh, does not really uh, have a lot of accountability and that accountability decreases um, per the power of the state. So the US, for example, has long evaded international law and China right now, I think, um, can also very easily evade accountability to international law. Thank you. Um, Istvan, you had a question? Uh, unmute yourself. Uh, maybe Fouise has a question first. Yes, yeah, sure, we could do that. There's, there's two questions in the chat. So um, there's one, um, could you shed some light on the international response to the Uyghur plight and what action the UN, the US and the EU can take to, to resolve the issue and are they likely to take that action? Yeah, so, um, you know, they, I think that, um, you know, in my perspective on this is that um, it's very difficult to change <laughs> state actions uh, on the domestic level. Um, you know, it, re it, it depends on, only, only the Chinese government can change its behavior uh, toward, you know, and its actions against the Uyghurs. So the only kind of international actions that can push that are really um, to put pressure on the government um, to change its behavior. And uh, I, you know, I think one of the things that the international community has done so far is um, they've employed these Magnitsky-like um, uh, sanctions on government officials who um, they can link to some of the repression in the Uyghur region. Um, but I think that has limited impact on China. Um, I think it has much more, you know, it may have more impact on a country like Russia where um, a lot of the Russian elite likes to come to Europe. Um, but the other types of actions that I think uh, may put more pressure on the government to change course are related to um, the, uh, the forced labor um, connection to what's happening to Uyghurs. So as there's boycotts, divestment, sanctions on companies that are intertwined with um, what's happening to Uyghurs, that seems to be putting some uh, significant economic pressure on China, uh, and at least on perhaps a significant part of China's elite. Um, and uh, I hope that that will uh, eventually you know, translate into changes in government policy. But this, the second part of this question, whether the EU, US, um, the UN, I don't think is, is going to do any of these things right now. Um, you know, it's, uh, China has positioned itself very well at the UN. Um, and as, you know, the US kind of exited the UN under Trump, China jumped into a lot of the roles that the US had, had played. And I think you'll see that the UN is largely immobilized. Uh, I would love to see an independent investigation but done by the UN, but um, I'm, not, I'm not too optimistic about that. But then when it comes to the US and EU, these kind of economic sanctions that deal with products um, there's going to be a lot of pushback on that. I think there's a lot of um, interest in supporting that, but companies are not very um, happy about that. So you have some significant multinational corporations that have supply chains tied into industries in China um, where uh, that are employing Uyghur coerced labor and um, those companies are going to push back significantly. So we've seen, you know, we've seen a, a, some 
reticence on the part of uh, European states and on, on uh, the part of the US, but we also um, see some action already happening. Um, so I think that that's what I'm hoping the future holds. Thanks, and I mean, especially, I guess, with um, the way in which COVID has impacted on lots of economic interests in the West uh, and how increasingly, um, you know, it, it has been China who's been bailing out many economies for mm -hmm. a number of years, at least going back to the, um, the crashes of 10 or 12 years ago. Um, related to that is this other question about if you think um, the, the recent kind of international coverage of what's happening to the Uyghurs um, has at least changed the Chinese narrative about what they're doing. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you can, you can kind of chart this. Um, I've actually seen a couple uh, papers taking different takes on this. Um, you know, you can see, uh, first of all, as I mentioned, initially the Chinese government said, you know, we don't have any mass internment camps, um, you know, that that's completely false. But, you know, the people were showing them on Google Earth. So it was it was almost impossible to deny that you can't hide 100 new prisons, you know, uh, not in this day and age. Um, so then they moved <coughs> towards this vocational training idea. And I think, you know, they, they even the, the Chinese state even had some kind of Potemkin village uh, press trips that brought people out to see them. And when people would get there, they would realize, you know, um, even the exemplary uh, camps in students they were being shown um, were very creepy. And it was obvious that, you know, there was, um, you know, an attempt to break these people and change their perspective and, you know, like, so, journalists would ask um, these people they had been given as exemplary Uyghur vocational training students and they'd say, oh, are you um, religious? And they would say, no, 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 I'm not religious. In, in, in such a way that was kind of like clear that this person had been um, scared into saying, I am not religious. Um, and um, so, so then, you know, there's been more and more acceptance of this, this discourse that this is about de-radicalization. And we have seen more and more information trying to push um, the counterterrorism narrative. Um, and, you know, that has been, you know, one thing um, that has been around for a while. And actually the book I wrote initially was really focusing on trying to understand the truth behind these claims of a Uyghur terrorist threat and trying to deconstruct that. Um, and then, you know, by the time I, I was getting deep into the writing, all of these other things were happening and it became very clear to me that there was this connection. But I think the Chinese state is now relying on that uh, connection more and more. Uh, it's always relied on it domestically, but now internationally, they're trying to use that as a as kind of a uh, uh, justification. I mean, just to connect to that before I go to Sven, sorry, Sven, to, to you, um, do, do you actually think the, the counterterrorism narrative is more effective with Muslim majority states than it is with, for example, the EU? Uh, <laughs> for example, the, the Pakistani state, uh, Iran, uh, a number of other examples have explicitly cited it as the reason why they're not doing anything or not raising this issue. Yeah, no, ironically, I think you may be correct. Um, you know, and I think part of it is about, you know, I think it's complicated why, why Muslim states are um, supporting China on this. You know, part of it is, um, that they are very reliant on Chinese money and they have lots of potential opportunity to benefit from um, more and more economic engagement with China. But, you know, it'd be erroneous to, to chalk it all up to that. I think another aspect of it is uh, another strategy of the Chinese government in trying to push back on this is saying, this is a CIA conspiracy. And that um, it's just like the, the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. 
Um, you know, and, and I think that narrative is very appealing to a lot of Muslim majority countries who feel, you know, that the U.S. Uh, has been acting with impunity in a lot of um, the Muslim world. Um, and then, then there's the factor that most Muslim majority states, um, you know, are very autocratic themselves and have been using the narrative of the war on terror to attack domestic opponents in the same way that China's doing. So, you know, I think it, that all of those things create a situation where it is uh, somewhat appealing to Muslim majority states. Uh, Ishvan, you had a question or comment? Yes, I actually have several ones, but I will maybe maybe ask just some. Uh, the, the cultural genocide or or genocide, simply just genocide. Well, it's it's a slide, isn't it? Because uh, as long as it involves physical uh, elimination of of uh, of people, there is an element of proper proper uh, just cultural genocide in it. So that's yeah, that's from. I don't know whether you would agree with this. Um, and another question is, what do you think? What 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 to do and what will happen? Uh, because it's it's quite similar to what has happened in in Tibet and is happening in, in these other problematic regions as well. That um, I think uh, Tibet has an immense amount of support from the West, much more than the terrorist Uyghurs. Uh, but uh, now there is a bit of support from the West. I don't know what whether it does anything. Um, so, so is, is it not just um, the Chinese state can do whatever they they want to do, and they will they will just do it as they did in in, in Tibet. I think Tibet is mostly accomplished now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, think, I think there's a couple of things. Um, you know, first of all, um, Tibet has. Uh, less of a population. It's a smaller population. Um, you know, it, it, it does have this kind of also escape hatch with its uh, Dharmasala, um, you know, alternative uh, Tibet. Um, and so in some ways, I think the Chinese government more easily pacified the Tibetan region to their liking. You know, um, you know they continue to uh, be looking for Tibetan separatists under every rock, but um, I think they they the Chinese government right now has has really significant control over the situation in Tibet. Uh, I think the Uyghur issue has always been a tougher one for them um, because it's a larger population. Um, it also um, you know has a history of resistance and. Um, you know, I, I do think that that we may see the end of, uh, you know, I, in, in the end of my book, um, in my conclusion, I basically, uh, you know, paint a hypothetical picture of what this region might look like uh, in 10 years, you know, and it's, it's uh, essentially that, you know, Uyghurs are, are really, um, there's, there's no, there's nothing left to suggest that this area is connected with the Uyghurs except some tourist sites. And Uyghurs are essentially, you know, completely marginalized um, and, and, you know, significantly depopulated um, and um, significantly assimilated. You know, the Uyghur language could be largely destroyed. Um, and uh, it'll create, it would be, it would be a, uh, I think it would be a difficult situation for China regardless though, because there's so many Uyghurs abroad because there's been these different cycles of repression that have led to, you know, Uyghurs leaving the country. And so Turkey has a massive population. Um, the Central Asian republics have a massive population. And now you have more and more Uyghurs in Europe and um, in the US and um, 
they're very intent on retaining their their culture um, and their history and all these things. Um, and so, you know, you might get to a situation where that's erased in China and it still exists outside of China. Um, but, you know, I would not be surprised to see, you know, something that looks like reservations, you know, in of Uyghurs in the Uyghur region in the future. Um, yeah, so I guess sort of classic um, settler colonialism, ethnic cleansing. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me, it's, uh, it's, it's just like a proper conquest in the, in the past. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it looks just so anachronistic in the 21st century that yeah. it, such things are still happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, then, and, and that's the interesting thing about it too, because the, the Chinese, like Chinese spokespeople from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they, their justification is often like, well, you guys did it, um, you know, which is, which is almost kind of uh, taking ownership of what they're doing. And it's true, it's true, like you said, it, I mean, this is classic stuff from the 19th century um but it's 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 jolting to see it in the 21st century but it, it's also i mean i think one of the things that brings up is you know we presumably have this since world war ii develop these um international norms that have tried to stop that kind of cycle and are we you know the, is this a sign that those are going out the window um uh, just one more thing on the on the extremism. Isn't there very simple cor correlation between Uyghurs not getting support from anyone else than extremists? So uh, they they are pushed. They they are pushed. Any form of resistance is is pushed towards this. And we we saw that happening in Chechnya also, which is a very similar case. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And elsewhere. So. Yeah. I think that's probably that's what is going on in Niger and 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 the parts of Africa with the with the Tuaregs as well. Then. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I very much, uh, you know, very much believe that. And when you talk to, I mean, I, one of the things that um, was a struggle for me in researching this is there's been a, there's been developed this entire industry of terrorism studies. And, and they have all of these assumptions about um, terrorists, you know? So like, it, if I said that to a, an expert, you know, in terrorism studies, they would say, oh, that's the push factor, you know? And then there's the pull factor of the ideology. Um, and uh, okay, but, but, but really what, you know, it, it is the case, I mean, the reason, that Afghanistan became a haven for um, disenfranchised people was because there was nowhere else they could go. And, um, you know, if somebody was funding them to empower them and give them uh, a sense of both belonging and, um, and weapons um, to, to take out uh, a lot of their anger on, on people that uh, had done them wrong, you, you see what, where this brings us, which is, in, in many ways, I feel the Uyghur issue, you know, should be a wake up call um, in terms of the, the global war on terror, which we're still very much involved in, you know, I mean, Europe and the US is still, you know, um, fighting uh, what, what in many ways is, is it's, it's not a completely imaginary enemy, but it's an enemy that they've kind of um, bolstered and, you know, given all kinds of powers that don't exist. Okay. Well, I don't want to, but just on the on the Uyghur mercenaries on, on Syria, and not just the, on the Uyghurs, but everyone who joins the Islamic State, uh, there is, there are push factors behind. Yeah. So yeah. it is, uh, we, I think we should be very careful and I see that very often in Muslims to, in Muslims to to dehumanize them. Yeah, but I think it's 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 wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I, I continue to, you know, uh, try to uh, 
chart this this group in Syria and um, I think in general Syria is is a completely different context than you know Afghanistan was in 2002 it's it's you know I mean there's all different uh, funding sources there's all different proxies there's all different powers involved and um, uh, a lot of these groups you know, are people who are just essentially they have nowhere else to go, whether, you know, they're already wanted for terrorism somewhere, rightly or wrongly, um, you know, they're, they're stuck there. And, and the Uyghur community there, what's particularly interesting about them. So first of all, they're people who fled China post 2009, after these riots happened in Urumqi and, and things got really difficult in the South, in rural communities. Um, a lot of them left on human trafficking networks through Southeast Asia. And the Chinese government strangely gave out passports to any Uyghurs who wanted them in 2015. And a lot of people just used those. And, and everybody went to Turkey because Turkey is the one country probably in the world that it, if a Uyghur shows up, they won't get kicked out, right? Um, now the Turkish state is now seems to be potentially starting to extradite some Uyghurs back to China. But between 2009 and 2016, about 30,000 Uyghurs came to Turkey. Uh, and it seems the Turkish government and various other interest groups, um, a lot of them pushed a lot of them into Syria. and, and a lot of the Middle East journalists I read who had encountered these Uyghur jihadists said, this group is, is very different because they're here with their families and they're almost more like a settlement because they, they literally had nowhere to go. Um, you know, and so it's uh, why they haven't left the lit because they have nowhere to go really. Okay, I think, um... Uh, we have taken much of your time, Sean, so maybe if we can give you one last question. There's a question in the chat. Um, uh, what role should universities, academics, and students um, play in this issue? What problems do you see with the internationalization of higher education that includes links with Chinese institutions that produce ideological and technological material used in cultural genocide? So a nice... Uh, a very kind of pointed um, question to our practice. Yeah, yeah, no, this is a very, um, a very lively debate now. Um, you know, and, and I think there's this, um, there's two sides to it um, that make it very, I think very difficult to navigate. You know, I mean, in the US at least what we're facing is we have a kind of right-wing political um, constituency that basically decides anything that's Chinese is now evil. Um, and uh, also that, you know, any Chinese people from the PRC are evil um, and must be avoided or, or maybe not evil, but there's certainly a risk. Um, and, you know, of course, that's not a very good um, narrative to start. Uh, and, it, and it leads to the same kind of, you know, thing we saw with the, the expansion of Islamophobia with the war on terror, you know. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, it's true that I think increasingly within China, it's very difficult to be independent of the party. I mean, this is part of the problem with biz the business relationships is those are very, um, very closely tied to the party. I mean, um, legal experts show that the legislation basically makes it impossible for a, a company in China to refuse a request for something from the government, you know, whether that be information or so on. So certainly the tech industry in China um, becomes completely intertwined with this. Um, 
in terms of educational institutions, it's it's I think it's more it's more complicated, but um, I think it has to be watched very closely. You know, uh, so you have like for example, in the U.S. these Confucius Institutes, and um, I think a lot of universities are closing them down just because they they don't. It's it's too it's too difficult of a situation to parse out. But I, I've noticed that um, these, these uh, organizations act very differently in different university settings. Um, you know, some of them actually try to push. So uh, for example, we have a Confucius Institute at George Washington University and I've it's never complained about me. Um, you know, uh, and I've never, you know, self-censored in terms of being critical of China. Um, uh, and yet there's other instances where, you know, I've spoken at universities where um, even the Chinese Student Association has pushed back on an event about Uyghurs. Um, you know, so it's, it's I think it's, um, it's going to increasingly become a problem. I think it's, it's, particularly evident when we talk about technological um, exchanges, research exchanges and stuff like artificial intelligence. I mean, I think that would be a toxic thing to cooperate with, you know, um, Chinese scholars on because we've seen that Chinese scholars are writing articles about, you know, uh, artificial intelligence um, being put into facial recognition so that CCTV cameras can um, ring an alarm when it sees a Uyghur face. You know, I mean, that immediately uh, brings a lot of, you know, <laughs> brings up a lot of red flags for me. Um, I think in the social sciences, it's more difficult to decide, you know, I mean, because I'm not, I'm not so sure that um, the, um, I think the biggest the biggest thing that universities have to be worried about with the humanities and social science science is giving a platform for people who want um, to basically deny what's happening, you know, or to personally attack Western scholars who are writing about this, you know. Um, so I think that that's um, that's one of the biggest dangers because. Um, you know, we've had discussions about this at, at our institution as well. Like, you know, we, you don't want to give a platform for basically uh, state propaganda, but you also don't want to close out, you know, um, any kind of engagement. Um, so I think, I think it's going to continue to be this very fine line to walk um, for universities, particularly as we, we've seen more and more cooperation over the last couple of decades between universities and Chinese institutions, universities in the West. Well, thank you, uh, Sean. I'm gonna actually stop recording at this point. Um,